Hello everyone and welcome to the first forensic image challenge walkthrough, Russian Tea Room. We're going to be going through just step by step how to do these forensic image challenges. Uh, in this first one, the only tool we're going to be using really is FTK Imager, which is pretty much just a hex editor. It'll show you the raw image file and also separate it out into the files within that for you. We're going to be using a Windows host as our device for forensicating this image. Uh, all of the tools that I use and any resources will always be free. Uh, with the exception of a few books. In this one, I used the book File System Forensic Analysis by Brian Carrier. It is the definitive file system forensics book, so I'd recommend getting it. However, I provided links to a few different sources that contain the same basic information, just a little bit harder to understand in my opinion. Uh, Anyways, a disclaimer, I am not currently a forensic expert. I'm trying to become one like I assume all of you are. I try to verify everything that I do and even those verifications will be in these walkthroughs because you should verify your tools as a DFIR enthusiast or professional. Uh, any feedback is extremely welcome because like I said, I may not always know what I'm doing. Please let me know whether you prefer a video or just a text document uh, and I can make the text a lot more thorough if it turns out nobody really wants a video. All right, so getting the image, we're gonna come down here to the Russian Tea Room case and this in-case image right now isn't working. It's giving us a 404 error. So I'll show you the dilemma with this iLook file, but uh, use the in-case one if you get the chance because uh, I don't think this file works with FTK Imager. You can also use this bzip2 compress dd1, uh, but you will have to decompress it. Anyways, what happens when you click on it is it doesn't download it. It just gives you all of this raw data here, and there's not really anything you can do with it. The reason being, you need a script. So I like to use PowerShell. I'm going to run it as administrator so that I can get it to access my documents. And uh, there's this commandlet called invoke-webrequest. And all you got to do is input the parameter URI and we will take the link here and paste it into that. Then you do out file and in quotes you put in whatever location you would like for that. Uh, I've already got it, so I'm not going to bother with downloading it because it's not working right now, but there it is. So next thing you're going to do is download FTK Imager. Uh, if you go to their website, it's going to have a little form for you to fill out. Just give them your email address and such, uh, and then it'll send you a link. So once you've got that, you can run it. And the first thing you click here is add evidence item. It's this little green plus in the top left. You're going to select image file because that's what we have right now. Next, go to your path here where you've dropped it and make sure that in the output file, that out file from PowerShell here, that you end it with the name you want and the proper file extension for whichever type you did download. E01 is the type for the in-case image, and you can see that here in the URI. So double-click that, finish, and there we go. We've got the file. Uh, an E01 file, I chose that because it's compatible with FTK Imager, but also because it is a compressed file, so it's smaller. It can also be split up into E01, E02, E02, E03, etc. If you have a larger 
image, you can split it up into those smaller files. Uh, in the event that you have that, when you add evidence item, just make sure that all of those are in the same folder and FTK will ingest them all together. So now about FTK Imager, it's got four main windows here. The first one is the evidence tree and you can expand and despand, let's say, these things here. Uh, each one that you click on will activate the view of it in the other windows. Uh, as you can see, when you're on the main image here, you don't get anything at all in this file list window. And that's because there are no files directly within the image. There are partitions, there are folders, and the folders themselves and such have those files. Uh, moving on to the file list here, you can see we get different kinds and different views, and that brings us to this, which I call the hex window. If you're on the image itself, then you can see we start over here with the offset column. There are three columns, and this is in hexadecimal. It starts at zero because it is an offset, meaning this right here is byte number zero in the offset and this would be two, so zero, one, two, three, and so on. Each row has 16 bytes, and 16 in hexadecimal is one zero, so that adds up there. You can also change this to decimal, and you do so by right-clicking anywhere on here, and you can show decimal offsets. I would recommend keeping it as hexadecimal for the simple reason that for now you want to get used to seeing hexadecimal and working with it a little bit. Next up is the data column here. It consists of these hexadecimal characters and one byte is represented as two hexadecimal characters here. So this 3-3 three, three for byte offset 1 here, that is one byte of information. You can highlight a section or a byte to get the offset of it. And you can see down here is where it shows it. Selection start equals zero. If I did it here, selection start equals 98. That is the byte offset. And as you can see, it is in uh, decimal, not hexadecimal. It also tells you what sector you're in. That will become relevant later on. The text column over here translates all of this, regardless of what it actually is, into ASCII encoded text. You can see for this section here, it actually worked because this actually is ASCII data. For all of this here, it basically isn't doing anything for us right now. Then finally, the properties window over here you can scroll through these uh, at the bottom and it just gives you some metadata about the image itself. You've got the path that it's at. Uh, you've got a MD5 verification hash. That is actually useful. You need that to make sure that the file hasn't been changed in any way. Uh, as a forensicator, you want to ensure that you haven't altered your evidence. Also, if you're downloading it like we did just now, you can verify that it is in fact the file that you attempted to download and it hasn't been altered and it doesn't have any sort of malware attached to it or anything like that. You also get bytes per sector. That'll come in handy later, but as you can see that multiplied by sector count here, that would get you the total length of this image in bytes. So among the files that FTK automatically recovers for you are allocated, unallocated, and file slack. You'll find these in the root folder here. Uh, you'll see that there's some other stuff in the partition. These actually have to do with the FAT file system itself, but these are the recovered files here. This one is still allocated. These ones with the red X in the little picture here 
are unallocated, which means that they've been deleted. And finally, these file slack, which are the result of the way that space is allocated to files in the file system. It's broken down into little chunks called sectors that are 512 bytes each. And obviously not every file is exactly 512 bytes. So after the file, you're going to have what's called slack space and little bits of old files that were unallocated and written over uh, may still be present there. So that's one of the places that you can forensically recover potentially useful stuff.